uh, ICAT and Michael Haney from uh, ECLAC. My name is Fabien Clement. I'm the regional coordinator for Latin America of a global program fighting illicit uh, financial flows from GIZ, the German cooperation. On behalf of the German cooperation, I'd like to thank all the people who have made this excellent conference possible. Uh, particularly the Friedrich Ebert um, uh, Foundation and Latindad. Before starting with uh, the, uh, these presentations, I'd like to introduce, briefly introduce the topic. I wanted to tell you why we are proposing this session on the tax uh, contributions by mining. Andres Carson had a key role in organizing this event, and we both read the title of this conference, uh, Lost Paradise, Inequality in uh, Tax um, um, in Justice, we immediately thought about the mining sector and why the mining industry. Why? Because we have known how um, they measure, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the um, uh, problems all these resources bring wars and social conflicts and so on um, the so-called uh, uh, mining damnation uh, and this happens with uh, um, countries that have many mineral resources but also the problem is that in those countries uh, many citizens do not benefit from these natural resources <laughs> uh, a big cause for this is tax evasion by companies devoted to extract, uh, extraction. And also, Carlos Bedoya from Latindad said so yesterday in his welcome uh, words that here in Peru we see a big problem with this. Um, in uh, cooperation for development, we know that the mining sector or the mining industry represents a very important industry for many countries in the world, and particularly developing countries. Uh, the sector, this industry, of course, brings a lot of opportunities for development. Uh, for mobilizing the necessary financial resources to really fund development. However, countries face important um, challenges in controlling transaction volumes and amounts and also to uh, regulate the sector from the tax point of view. In many occasions, international companies that have <coughs> many more capacities uh, concerning um, use mechanisms to reduce uh, their tax uh, uh, load uh, by shifting benefits and with uh, transfer prices. Um, it is very important then to analyze the fiscal or the uh, tax contribution of the mining industry and see what is the really the real contribution to countries. The states also have to work in strengthening their own institutions, improving regulatory and control capacities, defining more exact or more accurate um, estimations of these uh, flows and this is why it's very important to have regional integration to design public policies to reduce these problems. These are precisely the issues that are gathering us here and now and to tackle with them we have a very distinguished panel of experts. Just to finish, I'd like to mention that the German cooperation through the GIZ is supporting, supporting projects all over the world that seek uh, answers to 
two challenges on these matters. We are supporting counterpart uh, countries that comply with the new regulation of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative um, concerning um, uh, the um, beneficial ownership and also in Latin America we have uh, translations into English and, and French about uh, registration of um, uh, beneficiary uh, beneficial owners and in Africa we know it's difficult to um, start such a registration so there we are working uh, on due diligence methodology before permits are given to large international uh, companies, mining companies. Also, the cooperation with ECLAC and how they estimate to elicit uh, uh, financial flows in connection with the mining sector. It was Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, the Andean countries, right, and Colombia, too. Generally speaking, there is strong cooperation between ECLAC and GIZ on um, mining industry governance. If someone is interested, we will gladly share all these documents with you. Now, after this first introductory framework, we'd like to change our agenda a little bit, and we'll start with uh, Marcio Verdi's presentation. Marcio, you have the floor. First of all, it's a great satisfaction for me to participate in this at this debate panel. I'd like to thank uh, the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation, Latinda, GIZ, uh, TJN for um, this invitation and congratulate you for organizing this lecture, this conference. Uh, it has great value because for us who uh, are part of uh, tax administrations, it's interesting to see the intense participation of these organizations in um, significant uh, taxation issues, both domestically and internationally. Um, this is new. Uh, it used to be uh, exclusive for auditors and employees in the finance ministry, but now we live in a reality that will uh, give you a decisive role. It was very interesting to see this panel also about taxation and gender. That's very important. I think we will have some pressure on a number of issues related to uh, uh, taxation policies or tax policies that are outside of our tax administrations. Our tax uh, policy, we have to note is not the policy of tax administration. It's the policy that comes from our congresses, our societies that have their own idiosyncrasies. Um, the proposals by tax administrations uh, are an idea that are then transformed by political debate. So you are the main allies of uh, tax administrations. This is why I'm very happy to talk before you and participate at this event. Concerning mining, I'm going to talk about mining, but I'd like to include mining in a broader concept, which is extractive industries, because mining is just part of the extractive industries. Uh, our Brazilian friends, for example, extraction of uh, wood from the Amazon or burning wood to produce cattle, uh, cattle uh, destroying um, Belém do Pará, for example, um, in which they were burning the entire forest to produce uh, cattle. So that's extractive industry that is being destroyed, and um, there is no use for that uh, um, for that uh, lumber and gas and oil that has 
has a fundamental role in Ecuador, Bolivia, Trinidad, Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. So we have to think that mining is just part of the extractive industries, very important for Peru, Colombia, Chile, particularly those three, also Brazil. Mining is very strong there. But the extractive industry is also the farming production, the great foundation of Paraguayan economy today is, is soy. In Argentina, it's soy and wheat. That is agricultural production. And all the extractive industry is difficult to control. So um, in, in taxation terms, right? So uh, I'd like to mention the sixth method, sixth method that was created in Argentina. This so-called sixth method is used in Argentina and it's a law in 13 countries in Latin America today. The OECD has never acknowledged it as a specific uh, method, but it has accepted as an anti-avoidance method um, in the uh, cost method. But it was very efficiently approved in Latin America by controlling uh, product price on the export day and not on the sales contract day. The sixth method, I won't give you too many details here, but it is even more difficult for Peruvians than in other countries because when you export soy, it's soy. It's not two kinds of soy. And with oil, you have uh, an oil classification, but uh, everything is oil. In the case of Peru, it's difficult because Peru uh, exports a mixture. That's a big problem Sunat has to control. The iron uh, mining uh, company, uh, Vale do Rio Doce in Brazil, they export iron mineral, iron ore, 99% iron ore. Now they export balls. It's not uh, processed. It just goes through one machine. But when you export like soil and you have several products there like uh, uh, gold, uh, silver, uh, lead, uh, copper, etc. It's difficult to apply the sixth method. However, ta tax, uh, taxing uh, the mining industry is so difficult that it leads to abuse by these companies that expert particularly they are not if they are not domestic company. Chile has less problems than Peru because copper is from Colilco so there's a different relationship. Now the transfer price is a critical point in the industry's uh, taxation. Uh, thanks to GIZ, we had a seminar in Panama last week with almost all the countries here, particularly the mining ones, to debate on transfer prices in mining. Unfortunately, I didn't go. But those general considerations have to be taken into account because the mining industry is not easy to control by tax administrations. Now the question, is it contributing? I think it's contributing very little. I have some information for you here. Uh, many of these data come from ECLEC and Michael will talk about this probably. Take a look at the participation of non-renewable resources in Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Jamaica, Mex uh, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it goes from more or less 5.4 to 2.3 of the GDP. 
you see the uh, tax uh, pressure of those countries went from 20.1 to 20.4 and the mining industry share went f down from 5.4 of GDP to 2.3 they are producing less I'm sure it's uh, it's probably not a matter of uh, amount. The, we have light green in 2014, uh, dark green in 2015, and yellow in 2016. What can we conclude from this? All the countries that have in 2016 uh, concerning the share of uh, all that is collected is what comes from the mining industry. Here, the um, tax resources coming from mining are at uh, less than one half of the product, so it's a very small contribution. <laughs> Here, the fiscal resources and a comparison uh, in two years. Look at the case of Bolivia here. We have to mention them and applaud them because for those who know the tax uh, pressure of Bolivia when they changed the law, there wasn't an evolution in the oil industry uh, I that uh, reached other levels but now they are collecting up to 30 percent and they are collecting very well that's due to a change in legislation on this matter the lady was asking me about how to reduce evasion what are the techniques to reduce evasion and i said that a good part of evasion um, reduction is not uh, having an army of um, prosecutors on the streets it's just changing the legal framework in that way you can decrease evasion um, in a better way than with an army of um, auditors outside Brazil innovated and created the so-called uh, VAT uh, tax uh, substitution anticipating uh, the VAT collection from cigarettes, alcohol, uh, um, repair parts, etc., spare parts, breaking the chain of a traditional VAT uh, that is collecting from the manufacturers and it went up several times. So look at the situation here. Look at Colombia, Jamaica decreased, Mexico decreased, Peru as well. Dominican Republic and Suriname grew, but for other reasons, uh, due to other uh, income sources that uh, Suriname is exploiting, as well as uh, Guyana that will be in these statistics because they have discovered oil. Now look at the participation of resources from the mining sector and uh, related uh, and products related to hydrocarbons and oil this has gone uh, from 6 7 of the GDP to 2 of the GDP uh, if we talk about hydrocarbons and uh, to less than 0 0.5 percent in terms of mineral resources so this has something to do because we're not producing less. Of course, it was a price on this, but besides prices that have decreased a lot, we have a problem in terms of fiscal presence. I don't think that uh, you can read these figures, but uh, the importance of hydrocarbon uh, resources in the tax administration of this country is shown here. Uh, you can see that Bolivia, for example, uh, has 10% uh, of GDP in hydrocarbon resources. This is uh, the proof that uh, change in regulations can create an impact. And Dolores is going to speak about uh, measures in Ecuador. Uh, here we have Ecuador 6.3 for hydrocarbons, Mexico 5.9, Peru 1. 
Venezuela 11.2 and then we have uh, mining resources uh, mining uh, has less weight and the only one that is above 1% in uh, collection is Chile because when we go to hydrocarbons uh, several countries has uh, this as a main source of taxation as in Trinidad, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador Mexico, Colombia so the greatest problem is still in mining uh, this is my last slide because my presentation is very short. I just wanted to take a look at uh, the prices that are starting to recover. Uh, I hope that the uh, global demand will grow and will take uh, these prices to a more uh, favorable, favorable level for exporting countries. Uh, I have still one minute and I want to tell you that uh, mining sector taxation needs uh, the support from other uh, sectors of society because it's very different, different, difficult that a, a fiscal auditor knows the products we're talking about. So it's very important to that they uh, talk to other organizations uh, so that the uh, tax administration work is effective. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marcio, and thank you for your time management, too. Now we're going to uh, continue with Dolores and with the Ecuadorian example. I'm sorry, I need to put this back so that I can stand on it. Okay, so let's look at the presentation. I don't want to tire you, so I'm going to stop talking about gender, and uh, now I'm going to talk more about men's topics. No, I'm joking. Uh, well, actually, let me allow you to present, to introduce one of the most important industries for my country. I'm talking about the extractive uh, sector, especially related to oil and also uh, mining. Uh, and for mining, we'll talk about precious metals. Uh, I'm going to present my uh, do my presentation in four parts. First of all, we will have the legal context that is very uh, important because uh, legal contexts are very different in different countries and affect differently extractive industries. And number two, uh, how does this um, industry? Uh, uh, contribute to the economic system, and finally I will have conclusions. First of all, in terms of the legal context, uh, our 2008 constitution has a very important change. Uh, natural resources, non-renewable natural resources, among which we have, of course, uh, the extractive industries and the oil industry, belong to the state. Uh, they belong to the state and the state has to manage uh, the sector and regulate it too. So uh, the state can have public companies and in exceptional cases it might delegate this management to the private sector uh, while maintaining uh, most of the participation. Why is this important? Uh, let's uh, look at history here. We uh, were in a moment in which uh, the country gave extraction to private companies. This is, and when we had the uh, price boom in oil, uh, the country got the least, and the private companies uh, obtained many extraordinary gains. And there was very little left for the country. So it is in 2008 when we had a renegotiation of oil uh, contracts that the benefits uh, became uh, state property and 
we went from extraction contracts to service contracts. So we contracted uh, from companies so that they would extract our oil and in exchange of this we paid a rate. What does this mean that we uh, started having an investment that was approximately 14% of our GDP and that we could invest in our country. So it is necessary to put this into context because when you look at this in terms of collection, you will say, well, they don't bring a lot. But there actually was this big legal change. So uh, my country is still dependent uh, on uh, oil price variations, whether we like it or not. Uh, here we have GDP uh, variations, oil price variations, and the non-financial uh, deficit of the uh, public sector, non-financial public sector. When um, oil prices start to fall, our um, needs for financing increased. And I don't know about uh, the, increase, the, the increase of debt. Uh, in 2016, we had a deficit of 7.4% of GDP. However, the country has done efforts to improve tax administration, as I showed you in the previous session. We have uh, rose tax collection very much. Uh, to decrease our dependency. In orange, we see uh, oil revenue, and in blue, we see non-oil revenue. This is explained by the uh, fall in uh, prices, but uh, we can also see here uh, some improvements uh, linked to administration, especially regarding tax avoidance and evasion. In terms of contribution to the economy, approximately 1.5 of GDP depends on the mining uh, sector. In terms of export, uh, without the oil, uh, correspond to these sectors. So what are the uh, income that uh, the state gets from the extractive industry? This, these, this income is related to con annual conservation patents, royalties, um, labor um, profit, and um, taxes that come from the extractive industry. In terms of the first point mentioned, I thought, wow, they are thinking about uh, environment, the environment, because we're talking about conservation patents. When I uh, talked to Alarcón that regulates the mining sector, they told me, no, it's a patent so that they uh, keep the concession. So uh, it's useful uh, to do follow-up and control uh, concession companies. So it has nothing to do with the environment. But how does this patent work? Uh, this patent is dif differentiates exploration, initial exploration, exploration, advanced exploration, but it is also for small mining. And uh, we also have this patent that is uh, collected by hectare from uh, well, this is for, uh, th there is 2% for small mining. Here, you will tell me, what is the second item? In my country, 15% of uh, profit generated by company was given, uh, by companies were given to workers, and this changed in the case of the mining sector, and they decided that in the case of uh, small and big mining companies, the workers would have 3%, and uh, the central government plus subnational government would have 12%. So here we had uh, resources that were invest invested in the uh, in the circumscription in the area. But in the area of small mining, due to uh, redistribution. Uh, the workers that belong to small mining and not to big mining uh, will still participate with 10%, and here the state participates with 5%. And if I focus on uh, royalties, uh, 
the one that debt collection is internal income, and the passive subject is those who are uh, the head of the minor concession. And in this case, the case of royalties, uh, this is only for the exploitation phase. And it depends on the uh, modality. If you are a small, medium, or a big mining company, it also depends on the type of metal that you extract. And this is how royalties vary from 3% to 8%, which is the highest rate, and that is linked to uh, gold extraction in uh, big mining companies. So these are this is the scope approximately, uh, and I'm not going to give you the detail, but so that you can have an idea. In um, mining, in the mining industry, uh, there is a link with uh, net income. Uh, so here we have um, avoidance mechanisms because what you have in terms of sales, the international pr price, and this has to do with transfer prices. But you also have other costs that are uh, that can be attributed to this. And then we have non-metallics that are. <laughs> These are only linked to production costs. Additionally, there was a bonus for royalties. This is an anticipation that the company gives, in advance that the company gives. It's approximately 2% for each transaction that they will have during the exploitation period. When uh, the year advances, uh, this is uh, compensated in terms of what they did in uh, advances. Uh, now I'm going to show you something else from 2010 to 2010 participation that the state had or the income that it received is between 13 and the highest is 66 million dollars in 2012. But what was the main component here? It was conservation patents followed by royalties. And this is how uh, we can look at an anticipos and anticipates anticipate payments. Here we had the Mirador project, and in 2016 we had 25 from a Fruta del Norte. Uh, here I have con uh, information from the SRI. They gave us information from 2002 to 2017, where we can see that the mining sector in general uh, brought 5.1% of the total collection, approximately 0.64 of the GDP. But this uh, shouldn't worry us due to the legal change that I was explaining to you, because when in 2008 or since 2007 we started doing this uh, a contract modality change to extract mining resources, uh, private companies that were paying the income tax started uh, retrieving and they stopped contributing uh, this much. Uh, so this is a net, net collection for all uh, taxes and it includes income tax. The darker gray gives you an idea of the magnitude of the oil uh, industry because on uh, in the gray side we have um, crude oil. And during the last year, green part, which is uh, precious mineral extraction. Okay, so to finish with this, and then I will go to my conclusions. One of the questions that we had is, uh, where is the problem? Why are we not uh, collected, m collecting more resources? So I had access to the number of taxpayers uh, for um, mining and quarries. And look at what we uh, put in red. In other minerals extraction, we have 3,521 uh, taxpayers. Why? Because we have an industry that may be different uh, from what happens in Peru, in Chile, or Bolivia. Uh, this is basically concentrated in the uh, small and artisanal mining, not in the big uh, taxpayers. This is the first difference. Number two, the uh, stone and sand uh, extraction has to do with um, 
the um, construction sector, that's 1,039. So one of Ecuador's goals is to attract uh, foreign investment uh, for mining. And here we have done a series of uh, tax concessions to attract this industry. So we would need to evaluate uh, the what uh, stays in the country versus uh, the uh, this tax expenditure, this tax cut that we're offering to see if the country really benefits from this or not. So what we offer is uh, fiscal uh, stability for 15 years. We also offer accelerated depreciation in their assets. They can uh, decide if they want uh, a five or ten year asset uh, depreciation. So this allows them to reduce their um, expenditures. Then we give them back VAT and experts. This is since 2018 and it's not giving to all the industries. Then uh, we also give them um, a tax cut uh, uh, when their um, currency or when their uh, cash uh, leaves the country, we have a dollarized economy and they don't pay this, for example, for their machinery or this is given back to them. We also have a restricted tax for um, capital profit. So uh, only for uh, substantial transfers of uh, so these then we allow uh, for an investment in small mining and they were also exonerated from the uh, sovereign tax uh, until they have recovered their investment what does this mean uh, windfall um, Gains is when they uh, had at first a certain price and then the price in the market is much higher. So there was a tax uh, by the state for this. And in the case of mining, uh, we told them that we wouldn't tax them had their uh, investment back. Then uh, we have another calculation, which is what the state has received, we bring to present value, and then they do the same thing with the uh, mining, uh, with the head of the mi mining company. And if the state hasn't participated in the difference, there is a rate over 50%. So, conclusions. Uh, for Ecuador, 78% of mining activity comes from small mining and 22% comes from artisanal mining. So there are very few uh, big mining companies. We're just starting to get them. They are mostly Chinese, Canadian. It is necessary to evaluate the simplified system because uh, much of the uh, uh, small and artisanal uh, mining is in the RICE and this is used as an avoidance uh, system because uh, big companies uh, register these small companies and then it is these small companies that export. And we found out that our uh, small and artisanal mining companies were actually great exporters. Why? Because these had been exonerated from taxes. So we need to uh, regulate more the transfer prices, but most of all we need to evaluate the net benefit of the country in terms of uh, mining expenditure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Dolores, and thank you for uh, reminding us the clear uh, um, import the, the the importance of small international uh, mining companies. It is clear that uh, formalization process of these uh, uh, miners is key uh, for a taxation. So now let's continue with Michael. Michael, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you to talk about this topic that I think is very important. I want to thank uh, the organizers of this event. 
I want to thank the German corporation, GIZ, and thank you to the panelists. Marcio, thank you for your presentation. Uh, the figures were very interesting. Uh, we have worked several years in ECLAC to uh, improve transparency because uh, transparency in terms of uh, income, of tax income, is very important. And we're going to publish our database in terms of fiscal uh, income from the extractive sector this month or the next month. So this is just to let you know. I'm going to talk about um, the big context and I'm going to uh, talk again about some uh, items that Marsha al Marsha already um, mentioned and then I will uh, concentrate on the results of some studies that we did on fi illegal financial fluxes, IFFs, in the mining sector and then I will have some conclusions in the end. Uh, it is obvious in this graph that the region experimented an infusion of mining uh, income that is impressive during the last uh, decade as a result of a uh, rise or increase of the prices of these products. If we divide this period in two, between 1990 and 2002, uh, these countries collected Fifteen uh, billion dollars in terms of uh, mining income between 2003 and 2016. This income was 199 billion dollars. So the the amount is very uh, high. But in terms of countries, this regional trend uh, was expressed very differently, as we may see here. We have countries. Uh, emblematic cases such as Chile uh, where mining income uh, rose to very high levels above eight points of GDP uh, during some years and countries in Peru, Suriname where the importance of these uh, of this income in economic terms reached also very high levels but these uh, level differences, it is important, very important to look at the volatility of this income because this is a very worrying topic for all of our countries. And this volatility, as well as the uh, difference in levels of mining income, are also reflected in uh, impacts on uh, tax accounts. For example, in the case of Chile, that is remarkable, during the 2010-2011 period, mining incomes represented 18% of all of uh, public income for the government in general. So this is a very big amount. And only some years after, they were less than 4% of the total. So. Uh, the volatility is brutal. Uh, besides this aspect of fiscal contribution to public accounts, I want to highlight the differences in terms <laughs> of uh, mining uh, income composition. This is a very important uh, point to discuss the erosion base. Uh, the uh, tributary base erosion. In terms of hydrocarbons, we have uh, non-tax instruments, basically royalties and such. And to take an example, uh, we have Bolivia, uh, where uh, hydrocarbon royalties and a direct taxation for hydrocarbons carbons reaches 50% of the uh, production's commercial value. So this is a very high collection. Uh, however, in the case of the mining sector, uh, most income comes from um, taxing tools, especially uh, the payments of income tax. Royalties in this case, as a non-income, um, as non-taxing income, 
the the applied uh, rates are much smaller in Ecuador. Sometimes it's five percent of the uh, production's value. These differences also uh, produce differences in the collection of uh, general income by sector. In the case of the mining sector, we're talking about um, a collection that is much uh, lower than the hydrocarbon sector. And uh, since the ta tax income tax is the main way to capture um, funds in this sector, any artificial transfer in this uh, sector is very important. That's so what was our motivation here in terms of IFFs, uh, illegal financial fluxes? I work in a um, fiscal uh, topic unit, so we are looking at ways to mobilize uh, resources to uh, finance the 2030 agenda. And in this context, uh, the Addis Ababa Action Plan gives us a mandate to work on IFFs, fiscal evasion, and corruption. And in this sense, we had the pleasure of working with the GIZ, the uh, German corporation. We worked on a specific project on IFFs, um, tax evasion, and the extractive uh, sector. So I'm going to present uh, some uh, results of our work very quickly. To get started, what are some of the, the areas of concern in the mining industry. Here I took a list that the uh, OECD uh, recently published with Intergovernmental for, for Mining Metals and Sustainable Development. We know there are other channels, of course. It's a of things that encompass uh, BEPS methods, but also things that are m more directly related with uh, activities in the mining industry. And in our study, we have tried to uh, do research on the abusive use of uh, transfer prices, the undervaluation of um, mineral experts in this concept of um, uh, metal streaming. Uh, agreements in which a company sells its production at a predetermined price for a period and during this period the price can be very different as compared to the market price. So let's get started with this methodology that we had used before to estimate uh, illicit financial or illegal financial flows uh, for the region uh, uh, at large, which is a method of uh, uh, so, uh, social uh, country. It was uh, promoted by the Global Financial Integrity in the uh, ECLAC also and the uh, here we estimate the discrepancies that come from uh, trade statistics in bilateral uh, trade uh, between country, countries. So we compare the exports of country A to country B of a certain product with the imports declared in country B for the same product coming from uh, country A. And uh, there are some limitations with this uh, social uh, country methodology because we're using statistics of two countries. And uh, asymmetries can suggest or, 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 I'm sorry, can be caused by other factors that are different from the um, illegal financial flows. Uh, I mentioned some here. and. This is a key point, uh, the statistic uh, quality, because a curiosity we found in this study was that a country uh, that is so important in the trade of uh, gold and silver in the world, such as Switzerland, did not publish their imports uh, of these products 
before 2012. So uh, in the country uh, database that is the most used, they have no figures before 2012. And uh, fortunately, we found the report in the Federal uh, Customs Administration from Switzerland. They publish um, a number of uh, or a statistical series that is not part of the official statistics, but they do have figures. And we included that information in our study. It was very valuable. Uh, that uh, was a great contribution by the uh, Swiss government in their customs office. What did we find? I don't want to enter into many details in this methodology, but the image we see from this uh, analysis is that IFFs, um, estimated IFFs, showed a very increased growth after the crisis, and it was above the value of these exported products. Why is this so? In uh, the gold trade, we found many discrepancies that were very difficult to understand and explain, not only in terms of absolute value, but also uh, in relative terms. So we wanted to get into a little bit more detail for all these products to um, see what was happening. In we also wanted to know a little bit more how difficult it was for countries to control these transactions, particularly in terms of transfer prices. <coughs> Therefore, we adopted another methodology based upon uh, the customs records we had found. So we uh, did research or investigate a transaction per transaction based upon uh, a study by Hong et Alia. Um, well, which, uh, well, they propose a methodology in which they estimate the discrepancies between uh, unitary prices in these records and a market price. And this seems like uh, a little bit like the sixth method or the OECD's uh, method of the comparable uh, free price. In the uh, case of the mining industry, applying such a method is very complicated because the sales price of a mining product depends not only on the market price but also on other factors. So, price is the price is fixed by standard contracts for the sale of this product that change a long time that um, have. Uh, several uh, charges for refinancing or uh, the share of uh, uh, the founder in uh, price movements or additional uh, payments for uh, refined product uh, like uh, gold or silver in copper concentrates and also fines for pollution. So in this study, we included a, a model for uh, pricing to calculate uh, under billed or under invoiced uh, um, amounts. We were inspired by a study of the OECD that explained this phenomenon and how they fix prices. And their conclusion was that this is very difficult. And it is so very complicated, not only for us, but also for tax administrations. So I'll start with an easier case, which is the refined copper uh, case. In this case, we included Chile because uh, we're going to publish another paper on this phenomenon. So we decided to make a comparison between Chile and Peru in their copper products. Here, what you can see is that there is quite a strong correlation between recorded prices and market price, which is uh, the price filter here. However, we <coughs> 
found transactions that have nothing to do with the price movement. In the case of Chile here, we found that in 2005, Codelco, a state-owned company, signed a contract for the sale of copper with China Min Metals Copper, copper Cor Corporation from China for the sale of a certain amount of copper for 15 years. And the contract stipulated a price, basically a fixed price with some changes a long time. We, and we need to mention that something interesting in this contract is that in 2016, Codelco had to uh, uh, finish its participation in this contract because the internal tax uh, service of Chile questioned this contract because exports under this contract were channeled through a company headquartered in Bermuda. Uh, so there was a fine that Codelco paid in 2015. Our analyses and results show that we do find under uh, invoiced or underbilled uh, values, but more than the amounts, we should highlight change a long time. And we think that since 2011, there is an almost structural change in this. Uh, particularly in terms of uh, the percentage uh, of the exported value. This is something interesting. We don't have a clear response for this or for why this occurs, but we'll see this in another case too. This is the case of copper concentrates, a very important product for Peru. In the case of Chile, the correlation between the declared prices and the market price is quite strong. In these cases, we had to um, build some scenarios because the declarations do not include all the details about the composition of the exported good. In Chile, as I said, there is quite a strong correlation. In the case of Peru, there is great dispersion, and that has to do with the addition of fine products such as uh, gold and silver in experts uh, of this good. Therefore, as in the case of refined copper, we find in the case of Chile, uh, where we had information about composition, a significant drop in terms of this under invoiced amount. Very interesting. Now to finish, the most complicated case, and that's a case of gold. Here, I'm only showing gold in Colombia and Peru. In the case of Colombia, there is there are certainly transactions uh, that are below the market price, which is our filter. But in the case of Peru, look at this. There are very large differences that comes up from the fact that the exported product is very variable. Sometimes it has a composition of just 10% gold or sometimes 99% gold and unfortunately we don't have information for the entire period about the composition of the exported good. Therefore, in this case it was very difficult to use this methodology to calculate uh, under invoiced uh, amounts. In the case of Colombia it was interesting because the under invoiced uh, amount uh, in the two methodologies uh, showed uh, basically the same thing. In the case of Peru, it was much more difficult. Um, even if we adopt a um, much more conservative scenario of uh, just 20% gold in the composition of the exported good. So just to conclude, more than figures, what we want to highlight is 
the true difficulty to control these transactions and the importance of continuing to work in improving our regulatory frameworks, particularly for transfer prices. And um, there is, uh, uh, we need a lot of information also. Uh, we have to think if the information we are receiving is, is true. That's, uh, that's also debatable. And for uh, customs administrations, control in terms of seeing really what is the composition of the exported product is very important. This is how I end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. I think that these analyses are very important for countries that are dealing with this so they can take appropriate measures uh, that are based upon evidence and be able to face these challenges. Well, with this, we open the floor to uh, questions and answers. I see, I see three hands already. So let's start uh, by this corner. And then um, I want to say that Marcio will have to run at 12.30. So if you have questions for Marcio, uh, two hands. So I can see that it, that's, it, that's for Marcio. Thank you. A couple of questions. Michael and Maria Dolores. I start by Maria Dolores. What was the impact of the mining mandate of your uh, 2008 constitutional law uh, in connection with all this policy of uh, royalties and uh, taxation in the case of Ecuador? For Michael, the, the other two questions. To what extent uh, can um, the mining regulator in each one of the countries receive part of the royalties in uh, kind, in, in the metal or in the composition that includes the metal, so that the state, through a state-owned company, uh, trades uh, gold uh, abroad and builds capacity on the uh, trading mechanisms of precious metals in the uh, world market. This would facilitate uh, control. Um, and the question would also be if Codelco transfers this kind of uh, knowledge to Chilean mining regulators and if uh, um, they, there are experiences about this in other countries in the region. And finally, as a corollary of this, uh, what is the importance of the so-called um, arbitral uh, labs to determine if the coefficient of precious metals in the composition of exported products is relevant in connection to your study? Thank you. Introduce yourself. Andres Araos from Ecuador. The next question was here for Marcio, right? And also there, another question for Marcio. Okay, all the questions for Marcio, first of all. I'm Jean Carlos from Brazil. We're from the same country. What I wanted to ask you is that there is a study by the, the study of fiscal tax uh, justice about the export of uh, uh, Brazilian iron that uh, evaluates uh, under uh, um, invoicing. Um, I don't know if Michael knows about this study. I summarize it quickly. Brazil is the third or fourth uh, producer of uh, iron in the world. And 80% of Brazilian iron goes directly to China. Uh, it comes out from uh, the ships in Espiritu Santo do Pará and goes directly to China. 
and um, the differently from Ecuador uh, which uh, in which you have a large uh, company very concentrated this was Valley de Rio Dulce which uh, was privatized in the 90s it used to be a state-owned company now what did it do it opened an affiliate in the Cayman Islands first thing first um, and uh, uh, until 2016 uh, uh, I run in paper went to Cayman Islands and the ship went to China so the uh, federal uh, uh, the federal government uh, fined them for uh, this kind of uh, business and they opened an affiliate in Switzerland. So now Brazilian iron uh, is exported, I don't know, let's say 1,000 tons uh, in, in Switzerland and 2,000 tons in, in China. And you know what that means. So there is a study about uh, under um, invoicing uh, it calculates uh, it has calculated this for um, 10 years um, they estimate that this under invoicing or billing uh, reaches uh, four billion dollars um, I don't know if you know about the study uh, and uh, just as a comment and this has something to do with uh, the uh, mining damnation uh, in Minas Gerais uh, we had lots of poverty but we exported a lot of coal and now with iron we have the Mariana environmental disaster in terms of uh, iron they don't pay anything SMS export a tax uh, uh, etc uh, etc et they don't uh, all uh, pay for experts uh, the only uh, they pay is the income tax uh, with these uh, IFFs well you see production cost is higher than the export cost and then they don't pay they don't pay at all as I was saying we are paying to give iron to other countries and not only in this case but also um, its uh, share in the GDP. A Brazilian iron does not generate GDP uh, in Brazil. It generates GDP in Switzerland. It's clear. So uh, one of the reasons for which our GDP has reduced is there and uh, frauds are there and uh, always in the heart of this fraud well the uh, tax criminal um, havens in the gender debate yesterday the most affected by um, these uh, tax havens were women and uh, we have to uh, a, a focus this problem. It's not transfer prices. Gender problems and other problems are because of these tax havens, which are criminal. Look okay, at time, so Marcia doesn't uh, waste his time. I'll be very quick. Pablo Derencio from the International B uh, Budget uh, Budgeting Partnership. A question about uh, Marcio's data about the composition between uh, tax and non-tax uh, revenues from hydrocarbons and minerals. What I don't understand is that in some countries the composition goes on one side and in other countries on the other side. It's just that I don't know. I'd like to better understand uh, the uh, data uh, Michael uh, presented said that in minerals it's mainly non-tax and hydrocarbons it's mainly tax but if we see data for each country the composition changes a lot that's what I wanted to understand the second question is about f uh, fiscal incentives or tax incentives uh, yesterday we
presented our work in the regional project, but it's incredible that they give so many incentives to industries without even evaluating that. It's clear that there are technical difficulties, but clearly there is little political will uh, for doing this. So a question for Michael and Maria Dolores, how can we do so as not to give our money to uh, tax havens and the Chinese guys? Um, we have to make sense in this uh, to improve management of policies in the mining industry. Thank you. To continue with the next question by Marcio, well, for Marcio, then we'll say goodbye to 10 or 15 minutes. Madam, you have a question for Marcio, right? Sí, mi pregunta es sobre la cuestión tributaria. De, escuché desde su perspectiva en el ICAT que una de las cosas que han observado y lo que está haciendo eh, el CIAT en concierto con otros actores para resolver estos problemas. Well, the ICAT has been working on transfer prices, generally speaking. It, it, it has done so intensely. We have, we have an online course on transfer prices, 24 weeks. It is a very complete course because it includes the Brazilian methods to study transfer prices, which are very effective. I think this is the only course that includes the Brazilian methods. And we are organizing, and we have organized many many events. Two weeks ago there was an event about mining with all the region. Now the key issue, I'll take advantage of your question to also touch upon what you were saying uh, and perhaps um, the, I will leave uh, leave, the, leave this as food for thought in your debate with Maria Dolores and Michael. In 1992, I, already, I was already working with the OECD uh, like 28 or 25 years ago. Um, uh, at that time, I was uh, telling Jeffrey Owners that we had to do a advanced price agreements. I was saying it's impossible for a small country to control transfer prices. There is no capacity when you have uh, um, two in Honduras, the, large, the, 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 the big large four will hire them. So we have to have agreements with taxpayers. For years, the OECD did not accept the concept it is promoting now, APAS and MAPS multilateral advanced uh, prices, now they are pushing in this direction, but 20 years ago they didn't accept that. Then I but sincerely believe that a small country, particularly a small country, should try to sit with important taxpayers and have some sort of minimum um, tax paying uh, agreement. Uh, all the APAs have revision clauses in two years or three years because it's not easy to audit mining companies perfectly. It's very difficult. It's like utopian. The OECD methods are not bad, but they do not apply to the reality of mining industries. The sixth method is good for meat, for soil, but not for Peru because it's a mixture of minerals. So you better negotiate and sit with the taxpayers uh, and have them pay. The ICAT database is free. You uh, 
simply see ICAT data, and you, I think it's the 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 most uh, complete that is available. And now we have launched a publication, which has been an effort together with the United Nations. Our last publication is trying to uh, measure results. We'll know the value of uh, this, but we don't have the benefit. Uh, dear friend from, from Valle do Rio Doce, I have audited uh, Valle do Rio Doce. I, I have been in Carajás, Minas Gerais, and I can't speak due to uh, tax secrecy with our uh, story with the Valley. But I don't share your position because iron reserves of Brazil um, with a current uh, global market, we will have have uh, mineral to sell for 500 years and we have strong competition with uh, Australian and Canadian mines so Valley do Rio Dossi has uh, an important role it's not just uh, giving away our mineral because that it also gives the base of our own uh, steel manufacturing um, industry uh, the Brazilian steel industry is still very productive and all the mining used by Cozy, by Suminas, uh, Ziminas come from Valle do Rio Dulce. I think it's a large domestic uh, company and I respect it. It generates uh, product and development and I have audited their contracts indirectly. I, I think I, I don't have uh, the same vision you have excuse me and I don't think that we are giving away mineral because the mining uh, prices are very competitive what happened with your copper is understandable in the case of Chile because when you uh, sell copper you don't sell copper every week you make contracts that will guarantee your production too so sometimes you have to have um, financial balance clauses in your contracts if things are going wrong or if things are going very well. You don't want to kill your uh, buyer. Uh, Copper um, buyers are very large buyers, Valley, with the Brazilian rules. Brazil is the only country in the world that has its own price transfer methods, and Argentina that created the sixth method that is a law in Brazil. So I think that we are not giving away mineral. We are exporting a natural resource that has to be exploited because the risk of natural natural resources is that tomorrow we will have substitutes. Those uh, that have oil in just a few years will see uh, uh, substituted to a great extent. Gases are different because you refine naphtha, you will get uh, polys and plastics and this is oil and that is oil and you have oil here and that oil that comes from gases. It's a complex issue. Sure. With that, I have to go, but I wanted to tell you just one thing. Go on promoting your civil society work, but defend uh, tax administrations because uh, it's very easy to go to a country and criti criticize a tax administration. Uh, I participated in the drafting of the model from Cascade to a VIP model. Our bill had 10 articles in two pages. The Brazilian law is an encyclopedia, and that was congressmen that act as Santa Claus, giving a gift to this industry, giving a gift to the other industry, and tax administration is almost always a victim of uh, 
politicians and of industries. So you should be the main defenders of uh, the tax administrations that should get a medal. It's not easy to be uh, effective, ethical, indignified, and that's almost all the administrations, tax administrations in Latin America, devoted, serious, uh, honest people, and I'm very proud to lead an organization that works, and I'm very glad of having participated with you. I applaud the work done by civil society. I don't share opinions at 100 percent, perhaps, but uh, you have a fundamental role, and I have to leave. Thank you, Marcio. Thank you very much. Now we continue a little bit, uh, for a little bit, a little bit longer, and uh, we are speechless with these uh, uh, goodbye words. We'll continue with Maria Dolores and then Michael. Yes. So about the first question, uh, I want to give some context uh, regarding the mining mandate. This mandate was given in 2007 before uh, the Constitution was published. And what this mandate said is that uh, the mining concessions uh, were insubstantial without uh, an economic compensation in cases where they had an, an effect on environmental issues or where there was, not pri there was no prior consultation. So first of all, if the concession was in a protected area, if they hadn't paid any royalties or patents, if they hadn't done any investments, or these concessions were also reverted in cases in which there was a hectare accumulation in one or two people, and also for uh, officials. So I think that this did have a very important impact in making all these mechanisms more transparent. These mechanisms uh, that uh, allowed uh, evasion and avoidance. In terms of uh, tax expense, I think that this, I agree with you, this topic has to be evaluated. Uh, this is why I, I talked about what we are uh, renouncing to in terms of potential income uh, to be able to do uh, public expenditure. But actually, we have to look at the net uh, profit and we have to look at the impact not only from the uh, taxing point of view but also from the environmental point of view because um, many activities are linked to the use of uh, mercury or quicksilver uh, for example in the, uh, in the case of gold and this is very costly in terms of the environment and health as well as of gender because in the uh, mining exploitations, especially in small exploitations and artisanal exploitations, women do not enter the mines. They are not um, they are not hired, but they are what we call in some countries hancheras. Uh, so when the uh, workday is over, they enter the mine to look into the residues. Here we have women and children, and they take this to their houses to do to do mixes with quicksilver or mercury. So can you imagine the problem? I was talking to a friend that uh, works in Fruta del Norte, which is a new mining company, and he told me that they exported the mass, the, the mud that comes from the mines. They don't do any uh, refinery of the metals that are there, silver and gold. And so on the mining side, they told me this is due to security, because if we were extracting gold, uh, we would be robbed uh, before we could export it, so we would rather pay more for the whole amount of mud instead of just extracting the gold. 
And uh, he told me this was an avoidance method because in this mass there is a conversion factor, which is what he mentioned, in which you don't know how much gold exactly or how much silver, other minerals exactly you have in the mud. So if there is any discrepancy, you need to go to international instances where the mining sector is uh, will evaluate if the conversion factor is uh, real or appropriate. So can you imagine the uh, avoidance that you have? Because extracting this mud is not the same thing as, as if you export gold, because gold has other rules. Or you can also find more minerals in this mud, and they are uh, more expensive than gold, and you're exporting them with uh, avoidance mechanisms. Thank you for the questions. I think that the institutionality of these mining product sales is uh, very important for economic policy in our countries. The fact that Chile has a state company that is really uh, strong in terms of mining sector gives the country a lot of information regarding what is happening in the sector, especially in terms of uh, associated cost to production, cost associated to production, and this uh, facilitates very much uh, control, not only uh, regarding transfer prices, but also, for example, for income tax payment. So I think that it's very interesting, but it's a different question for every country. And uh, the question on the laboratories is also very important. I think that the um, customs administrations have to think on how to strengthen this element uh, when trading these products because as Maria Dolores was saying, we are exporting products in which uh, you could include almost anything, and especially gold and uh, silver, which are very uh, expensive metals. So we need to reinforce this aspect. And to uh, answer to one of uh, the questions for Marcio, and I'm going to speak in English, En términos de eh, los problemas uh, fiscales que son importantes en el sector mineral, la transferencia de precios siempre ha sido algo muy importante y eh, ICAT tiene razón, ellos han trabajado mucho en este tema y nuestras investigaciones han mostrado que la transferencia de precios es un problema, los precios de transferencia son un problema, pero también eh, quisiera decir que hay otros eh, canales que también están emergiendo en términos de eh, gastos innecesarios y otras maneras de reducir eh, las ganancias que se reportan en los países. Es muy importante que investiguemos este elemento y nuestros colegas en la Tindata han trabajado en esta área y creo que sería muy interesante que usted pueda ver estos resultados. Now we're going to have another round of questions. I'm sorry because I interrupted the gentleman that is over there. Thank you. I'm Mario Valencia from the uh, Colombia uh, Tax Justice Network. I want to share a little bit about Michael's topic because we did the study in Colombia uh, about billing by using a financial integrity uh, methodology and what is uh, curious about this topic is that after many critiques where we were told that we could not do things this way because it because the uh, oil company in Colombia that is public could not use these mechanisms. We found that 85% of all of its billing correspond to the oil sector, and everybody said that it is impossible that public companies are doing that. Two months later, tax administration published a study uh, in which the results are very similar to ours. So 
These methodologies, those that you expose, are very important because small organizations such as ours can apply it, and we need to do an effort to spread this kind, uh, these methodologies more, these tools more, and also regarding tax benefits. Uh, in Colombia, we have 233 different kinds of tax benefits. Some of them uh, come from mm, 1959, so tax benefit from that uh, year evidently uh, does, does not um, call for compensation of this benefit. And this has a cost of $5,000 million uh, per year for the country's finances. So as much Uh, a pressure, a social pressure, so that these topics can become public because um, the government in Colombia is not interested in having this uh, disseminated, although uh, Colombia has a uh, law to disaggregate uh, tax benefits. But the state does not comply with this law, simply. They just don't do it. So I think that this can be done uh, through social pressure and by supporting tax administrations. Of all, uh, congratulations. Uh, you, the three presentations were amazing. Maria Dolores, I have been a uh, tax director for two Spanish multinationals, and serious uh, multinationals do not look at uh, tax incentives to invest. Uh, tax incentives. Uh, I'm not uh, in favor of them because they don't take anything to your country. This has been proved. Uh, you said that the impact is to be verified, but I, I can tell you that the, the impact is, will be very difficult. So have a level playing field. Uh, you should not offer any uh, tax incentive, and uh, companies that are really interested in your resources will invest. And the ones who don't, well, maybe it's better not to have them in the country. And regarding BPS and transfer pricing, uh, it's true that uh, the OECD has these methods that are not always easy to apply, and I know it because of my practice. So I think that one of the uh, works uh, done by OECD uh, is very important, getting closer to Latin America and trying to adapt some prices that uh, still need uh, new methods. So uh, this is a work that is uh, being done, and we will look at the results of this soon. Uh, it is true that uh, in the OECD, the transfer pricing methods are very lab-like, and they cannot always be, in, be applied in different sectors. Thank you. OK, uh, now let's continue on this side and then on the other side. And please uh, be brief and as well as in the answers so we can finish at one. I am from ECLEC. Uh, my name is Victor. Thank you for your presentations and uh, thank you for discussing certain topics with me too. Uh, I only wanted to ask Michael something. Uh, Marcio mentioned volatility, which is important and you uh, emphasize uh, institutionality. Much of the uh, boom and of the good times that the region spent, uh, which were related to the super cycle, um, explained uh, an abundance of resources to invest in social expenditure. But many countries were exposed to the volatile cycles which we all know, and we didn't take uh, necessary precaution measures. This was not the Chilean case in which we had the stabilization fund. So when the crisis of 2008 arrived, the authorities could give some kind of response. So I wanted to ask you, Michael, if uh, besides the tools to stabilize, stabilize, what other strengths that you consider the countries should have to navigate in these waters that, as we know, bring a lot of resources, but at the same time, the uh, volatility creates many ex much exposure uh, during bad times. 
except in the case of Chile, where they have a ministry, but also um, uh, institutions such as Cochilco, the Chilean Copper Commission, who is always checking on the market and uh, gives um, advice for contracts, etc. So can we have your opinion on what we need to uh, avoid the um, resource curse? I don't like this term because I don't think that it exists, but I'm just trying to give it a name. Okay, then we will continue on the other Thank you very much. I have a concern in terms of uh, how royalties are treated. In Peru, there's a re, uh, royalty law that was an initiative of Javier Díaz Canseco that is no longer with us. But afterwards, uh, the, these royalties were um, transformed into into a donation. Last year, there was a collection of uh, $5,000 uh, million dollars in income taxes from mining companies, but we uh, gave a tax cut of uh, $4,000 uh, million, dollars. so it looks like a game. But if we look at the uh, company income tax, we see that it goes down while workers, the taxes go up. So when we rise uh, VAT, how can we uh, have a more democratic and technical vision so as to have more justice and tax uh, payment? Uh, charging crisis on the workers back is not the solution. So I would like to know how you deal with royalties in different countries in Latin America. So here we're talking about uh, diminished royalties uh, from the mining company's request. And I come from um, Federation of Customs and Tax Workers of Peru. Thank you. Share this question? First of all, I, it's not that I agree with uh, tax cuts. On the contrary, it was always the opposite. When we were in the uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, and and on the uh, on the contrary of the uh, Ministry of Production, we were qualified of uh, taxists because uh, we didn't want to give any incentive or any cut. And there are many studies in the region where it is demonstrated that uh, tax expenditure hasn't contributed in, at all to attract investments. But on the other hand, you have uh, production ministers that are corporatized or that have interest behind them and they uh, defend and boost more and more tax cuts and at some point we are in the train of uh, economic policy, no, politic uh, uh, economics. So we have to take this to the, the, the assembly and this finishes in a, in a Frankenstein or in a second best with we can all with which we can all um, live. So you can be a very good technician and planify, but this is not necessarily viable politically. And here I want to answer to another question. I'm talking about I want to talk about the oil funds. Uh, we had in my country five or six uh, oil funds. Uh, they all uh, went through Congress or through the Assembly, and they were all pre-allocated. And at one point, they only saw money, so uh, they they gave funds to uh, several institutions, but they had nothing to do with the. Um, other topics. And I think that we also have to work on financial derivatives that are linked to uh, renewable resources, uh, non-renewable resources. Uh, so how to work with the different uh, financial derivatives. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to add that the case of Chile is very special because there is a structural law in this country. Uh, that uh, is about these funds, and this law does not exist in other countries. So 
institution institutionality in terms of funds of uh, tax laws is very big and for our countries it will be a discussion a topic for discussion during uh, following years especially if prices uh, bounce we will see Did we have any more questions? Okay, so we're going to finish with these last three questions. Uh, okay, so regarding the valid study, it's uh, available in the Latin Dad site. I think that uh, Marcio is not aware of this. So uh, we have this, this study, it's published in Spanish. And if you want to check it, you can uh, look at the Latin Dad uh, website. It's about IFFs going through Switzerland that generate GDP in Switzerland. And you can also find values here. I just wanted to ask Michael. Uh, there is another Latin Dad study on Yanacocha. Uh, there is even a book, a published book on this. Uh, I thought that I would hear something related to this because Yanacocha is Peruvian. I think that it's one of the main mines in boom. Peru uh, that, uh, during 2013, yeah. during the boom, when the, when gold was extremely uh, expensive, they didn't pay any Thank you. I am Ivan. I belong to the Fundar organization in Mexico and recently we analyzed uh, the fiscal situation of mining companies and one of the problems that we identified was the lack of databases regarding uh, taxpayers. This uh, SAT has this database and uh, the economic secretariat has another base of this kind regarding the payment of uh, non-tax contributions and we discover that none of these um, institutions has the same information there are many uh, deficiencies and this of course impacts the level of collection so I wanted to ask if this is a situation that is also found in other countries of Latin America thank you and please let's have uh, the last question from William thank you very much Muchas gracias. Dos comentarios. Basándome en la presentación de Michael, muchas gracias por una presentación excelente. Hemos conversado ya de una de ellas, pero creo que sería interesante para los otros participantes. En uh, la Asociación de Naciones Surasiáticas, eh, que tiene un, una zona de libre comercio, uh, acaban de adoptar un sistema en donde eh, las eh, facturas van a hacerse eh, sin papel. Um, los colegas de Asia Pacífico creen que esto podría eliminar los flujos financieros ilícitos eh, en la medida que las facturas eh, actualmente se usan para este propósito. Y lo segundo que quería decir era que hay algunas eh, compañías que han desarrollado soluciones de software para las autoridades aduaneras que permiten que estas automáticamente comparen los precios unitarios de los bienes eh, comercializados con para los envíos individuales eh, comparen esto con los mismos tipos de bienes en el mercado entonces establecen una regla para eh, eh, ver cuán lejos está eh, ese bien comercializado respecto de otros bienes de esa misma categoría. Esto puede ser una solución interesante. Gracias. So we are going to close. So uh, maybe you want to share some uh, conclusion words. Please go ahead.
Uh, hi, thank you very much for your attention and for spending this time for us. I think that this topic is very important uh, for all of our countries and uh, I am happy to see that uh, several of you are doing similar studies and that this information is being disseminated in civil society. So please continue with your work. I just wanted to uh, talk about information. I think that uh, tax administration's uh, role in giving this information is key because it is because unfortunately all of this information is not on their web pages, but they have it. Uh, the level of information in terms of uh, data administrative registry is extremely rich. Uh, and it allows to make good decisions. For example, uh, the data that I cited, that I quoted here, is because our Ecuadorian tax administration has uh, six digit uh, figures. I can request it. It's not published, but I can request it. And they gave it, okay, they gave them to me month by month. So one can have that information, but it is also necessary that tax administration uh, gives us that uh, gives us that information so that c civil society can review this information and start generating debates. Uh, this can allow to have ways and counterways regarding decision makers. So let's close this session. Thank you very much, Maria Dolores and Michael. Marcio has already left. Thank you very much to all of you uh, for this very good debate. There was a lot of energy in the room. Thank you also to uh, the organizers. Um, thank you to the translators, interpreters that have worked more. And so an applause for all of you. Thank you.